Welcome to the exciting world of chapter 13. In all seriousness, chapter 13 is probably the most important chapter that we'll cover the entire semester because it really deals with decision making that you're going to have to face on a daily basis in the business world. The biggest issue in this chapter is that there aren't any formulas just to memorize and regurgitate. It really takes a lot of thought. There's some critical and analytical thinking that's going to happen in this chapter in order for you to succeed. We're going to be focusing on different types of decisions, and in those decisions, some information will be relevant to the decision and some won't be. And that's generally what students hate. Any type of exam question where extra information is provided, generally students hate that because they think it's a trick. Well, it's not really a trick. The whole goal of those types of problems is to determine whether you can differentiate between what matters and what doesn't. And that's really what this chapter is going to focus on. For various business decisions, it's going to help us determine what matters to that decision and what doesn't. Why is this important? Because if we include things that are irrelevant in our decision making, we're going to come to the wrong conclusion. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is identify relevant and irrelevant costs and the benefits in a decision. Because if we don't identify what's relevant and what's irrelevant, we're going to use the wrong information in our decision-making process. So there's a few key concepts you need to know before we move forward. First, every decision involves choosing amongst at least two alternatives. Therefore, the first step in decision-making is going to be to define the alternatives being considered. Why does there have to be a choice among at least two alternatives? Well, if you only have one alternative, there is no decision to be made. You have no choice. So there's always got to be at least two or more options in any decision. And the first step is figuring out what are those options exactly. The second key concept is that once you identify your alternatives, then you have to figure out what the relevant and irrelevant information is. So relevant costs and relevant benefits are the only ones that should be considered when making decisions. Irrelevant costs and irrelevant benefits need to be ignored. Of course, that means we need to be able to identify the difference between the two. So the key to effective decision making is differential analysis which is focusing on the future costs and benefits that differ between alternatives. That's the key to identifying what is relevant. The only things are, that are relevant are the things that differ between alternatives. That's the key. Everything else is irrelevant and needs to be ignored. So a future cost that differs between two alternatives is known as a differential cost. A future revenue that differs between alternatives is known as a differential revenue. Differential just means it's different. An incremental cost is an increase in a cost between two alternatives. Therefore, it's different between the alternatives. And an avoidable cost is a cost that can be eliminated by choosing one alternative over another. Again, that means the cost will be different between alternatives. So the key to identifying relevant information is to ask yourself, will this item be different between the two decisions that I have to make? If the answer is yes, it's relevant to the decision-making process. If your answer is no, it's irrelevant and should be ignored. And by including irrelevant information, we will arrive at the wrong decision in the real world and the wrong answer on the exam in our world. Sunk costs are always irrelevant, and this is really hard. It's, e it's easy to memorize. Sunk costs are always irrelevant, like a robot. But you have to understand that emotions get in the way. And what I mean by that, if we were in class, I'd ask you, as an example, if I were selling my house, would what I paid for the house be relevant to my decision as to how much I'm going to list it for? And most students would raise their hand and say, yeah, it would be, it would matter. And unfortunately, emotionally, it does matter to us as a seller of a house. We're thinking, oh, I paid this much for it. I put in all this money to, you know, rehab it or put new paint on the walls or put an addition on. And we factor all of that in in our decision making. But the reality is all of that's happened in the past. It's a sunk cost. It doesn't matter. So what should matter is just what I could sell my house for given current market conditions. What are houses of similar worth selling for currently. 
what I paid for in the past doesn't matter. If that doesn't make sense, let's go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. How many of you, when you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, eat more than you really should? Usually, if we're face-to-face, -face, most hands go up, including my own. And the reason for that is that we factor in the sunk cost in our decision-making. If we pay $10 for an all-you-can-eat buffet, the minute we pay the $10, that $10 becomes a sunk cost. No matter how much we eat or don't eat, that $10 will not change. But in our brains, we figure we want to get our money's worth, so we gorge on the food and then end up feeling sick afterwards, or at a minimum, at least gain a few pounds, none of which is good for us. But in our brains, we're saying, oh, we want to get the most value out of the deal, so we want to eat more. The fact that the $10 was paid in the past means it's irrelevant. What should matter in making decisions as to what to eat is how hungry we are. We should stop when we're full not keep eating because we want to get a good deal or get our money's worth. But all the time, sunk costs play into our mentality and our thinking and, and make us arrive at incorrect conclusions. This is why the fifth, Freshman 15 exists. You come in, you got the dining hall, it's unlimited food for what you pay, you might as well get your money's worth and you gorge yourself and then ultimately end up gaining weight. Using sunk costs in our decision making always is a bad idea. Future costs and benefits that do not differ between alternatives are also irrelevant because if they don't differ between alternatives, who gives a shit? It doesn't matter. It's not going to make a difference because either way, either decision we make, the result is the same. So by including that type of stuff in our decision making, it just muddies the waters and makes things more difficult. So we want to remember the only things that matter are the things that change. And that's going to apply to all the different types of business decisions we discuss in this chapter. So I'm going to repeat it again. The only thing that matters is the stuff that changes. If it don't change, it don't matter. And I know that's poor grammar, but it gets the point across. If it don't change, it don't matter to our decision. Opportunity costs also need to be considered. The opportunity cost is the potential benefit that's given up when one alternative is selected over another. You all have an opportunity cost when you go to college. You're paying money for college. But in addition to that, there's an opportunity cost in that while you're in college, you can't be working as much as you could otherwise. So the amount of money that you could be making working instead of attending college is an opportunity cost. So why the hell would anybody pay for college, given that they're having an outflow of cash to pay for college and giving up money they could be making in another job? Well, the answer is you're hoping that your future earnings will far outweigh your earnings as they would be today without a college education. So that's why people go to college. The idea is hopefully you're going to increase your future earnings potential. But there is, is an opportunity cost to doing so. So let's look at an example that hopefully you can relate to. Uh, Cynthia is a Boston student, is considering visiting her friend in New York. How we could Cynthia could be a Durham student too. She can take uh, a train or drive, and we can do that from UNH, right? So by car, it's 230 miles to her friend's apartment. Uh, and she's trying to decide which alternative is less expensive and then gathered a whole bunch of information. So she has annual straight line depreciation of the car, which is just the cost of her car minus the salvage value divided by five years. That's just given. We've got the cost of gasoline. You can see at the time this was made, uh, the, the cost of gasoline was a little different than it is right now. But ultimately, the cost per mile is calculated by taking the cost per gallon divided by her miles per gallon that she gets on her vehicle. And then you have uh, the annual cost of insurance and licensing, the maintenance and repairs cost, the parking fees for her school, and the average cost in total. So basically, you're taking all these costs and figuring out what the cost per mile is. Now, you may look at this and say, all right, well, it costs 61.9 cents a mile, but that may not be true because some of the information that's included here is relevant and some of it isn't because some of it won't change whether she drives or decides to take the train. 
and that's how we arrive at incorrect solutions. If we include irrelevant information, we'll arrive at an incorrect answer. We'll get into that a little more in a bit. Some additional information uh, that we have is given at the bottom here. We have a reduction in resale value per mile for wear and tear. We have round trip train fare. We got the benefits of relaxing on the trip. That has question marks because it's a qualitative, not a quantitative factor. Certainly, I would imagine that relaxing on a train would be worth some amount, some value, but what is it worth? Uh, we don't know. So that makes it a little more of a challenge. But, you know, the stress of having to drive into New York City and deal with the traffic versus sitting on a train and letting someone else do the work for you. She has a dog. She's got to put the dog in the kennel when she's gone. There's a benefit of having a car in New York. You can get around without Ubering. There is the hassle of parking the car in New York. And then there's also the cost of parking the car in New York. I don't know where she's getting parking for 25 a day in New York, but I'd like to find out because usually it's a lot more expensive in New York to park. But anyways, this is all the information that we have available. So now we got to figure out what, if, what parts of this information actually matters because not all of it does. So which costs and benefits are relevant to Cynthia's decision? Well, the cost of the car is a sunk cost. It's not relevant. So it happened in the past. It shouldn't be included. The annual cost of her insurance is not relevant because it's going to stay the same whether she drives or takes the train. However, the cost of gasoline is relevant because if she decides to drive, she's going to have additional gas costs. She would avoid the cost of the gas if she takes the train. The cost of maintenance and repairs is relevant because in the long run, these costs are dependent upon the miles driven. Think of like your oil change. You're supposed to get your oil changed every 5,000 miles or so, depending on your car. So if you drive more miles, then you're going to have to get that oil change done quicker. The monthly school parking fee, however, isn't relevant because whether Cynthia takes her car or whether she leaves it in the parking lot at her school, either way, she still pays that annual parking cost. So at this point, we could see that some of that average cost that we figured out of 0.619 cents per mile are relevant and others are not. Let's continue our discussion. The decline in the resale value due to additional miles is a relevant cost because if she drives, she's going to reduce the resale value by adding miles to her car. If she takes the train, she won't. So again, it's different between alternatives. The round trip train fare is clearly relevant because if she drives, she doesn't pay for the train fare. If she takes the train, she does. Again, different between alternatives. Relaxing on the train is relevant. However, it's going to be difficult to assign a dollar value to that. So we're going to keep that out of our decision making, at least on a monetary basis. But we should still consider it in the end when we're de determining the best course of action. The kennel cost is not relevant because whether she takes the train or drives, the dog is still going to have to be boarded, assuming she's not taking the dog with her. The cost of parking in New York is relevant because it can be avoided if she takes the train. Likewise, she has to pay for it if she drives, so it's different again between alternatives. The benefit of having the car in New York and the problems finding a parking space are both relevant but difficult to assign a dollar amount to. So from a financial standpoint, Cynthia is better off taking the train. How do we figure this out? Well, we have to look at the financial cost of driving that's relevant. And we determined that the gas was relevant, 460 miles round trip at 10 cents a mile, 46 bucks. The maintenance is relevant because the more miles she drives, the more maintenance she's going to have to pay for for her car. The reduction in resale we decided was relevant, and then parking in New York was relevant. So that means that the total cost of driving is 137.86 versus taking the train, the cost to take the train is $104. We excluded all the irrelevant information in making this decision. If we included that, we may arrive at a different incorrect conclusion. So that's why it's so important to identify what matters and what doesn't. How do we know what matters? All we have to do is ask ourselves, is it different between alternatives? Now, Remember those qualitative things like relaxing on the train or the difficulty finding parking in New York or the benefit of having a car to go around in New York. We would consider that at this point when we're comparing the difference and we'd say, well, 
is that difference of driving, that extra cost of driving, worth it based on those qualitative factors? And there is no one definitive answer to that, so on an exam question, I wouldn't ask you that because we all have our own opinions as to what the value of relaxation is worth, what the value of convenience and having the car is worth, but it's something that would have to be considered in the real world. Let's look at another example related to a company. Management of a company is considering a new labor-saving machine that rents for $3,000 a year and data about the company and its annual sales and costs with and without the new machine are, fo are as follows. So our sales you can see stay the same with the new machine or without it. Direct materials stays the same but labor changes. The new machine is going to reduce our labor costs by $15,000. So that matters. Variable overhead stays the same. So the only thing that really matters is the change in direct labor costs. And then we have uh, the rent on the new machine that also changes. Those are the only things that matter. Everything else is irrelevant. So we can arrive at this answer a lot easier. All we have to do is compare the direct labor cost savings of 15000 to the additional rent of the machine of three, and we arrive at the answer of 12000 So rather than include all ir irrelevant information and making the problem look far more challenging than it really is, all we have to focus on is what's different to make the decision and to arrive at that same answer of 12000 benefit for renting the machine. So focusing on differential analysis is extremely important for businesses because it cleans up the waters and makes it easier to see the appropriate solution at the end of the day. So using the differential approach is desirable for two reasons. Number one, only rarely will enough information be available to prepare the detailed income statements we saw in the previous example. So if we don't have all the information to prepare the full income statement, we're not going to be able to compare the income before and after the decision. So instead we want to focus on only the items that are different. And then mingling irrelevant costs with relevant costs can cause confusion and distract attention away from the information that's critical, which is what is going to differ between alternatives. At this point, I should sound like a broken record because all I've really said over and over and over again in this segment of the video is the only thing that matters is what changes between alternatives. That has to be your focus as we approach all of the various decisions in this chapter. The only thing that matters is what differs between alternatives. If it don't change, it don't matter.